to make a very brief presentation on the bill before was shortly entitled the Cannabis Bill 2020. And as I do so, I would like, if you can bear with me, if I put in historical context why we are here again. Now, the speaker before me, and I am sure the honorable mover of the bill, as well as the honorable attorney general who seconded the debate this afternoon, would have concurred that the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, the team unity government, had embarked on this process of uh, liberalization in a measured way of the cannabis uh, use and the development of a related industry in a manner that made sense. The mover of the bill would have gone to great lengths to put into context the incredible work that was done by the Marijuana Commission which is now succeeded by the second phase of the commission to take the process forward. The Honorable Attorney General was even more comprehensive in his outlining of the various aspects and features of the bill. So I will not labor this Honorable House by repetition because that was well established by those two speakers. However, my mind goes back, as I said, in terms of putting things in historical context to the 29th of July, 2019, when we came into this house to look at an amendment of the Drugs Prevention and Abatement of the Misuse and Abuse of Drugs Amendment Bill 2019. And I have here the statement that I would have made at that sitting, which was essentially to indicate that the government would have begun a process in 2017 with the establishment of the Marijuana Commission which basically continued its work with extensive consultation throughout the length and breadth of the Federation to hear from the public their views on issues as it relates to liberalization of marijuana, etc. While we were in the middle of all of that, and shortly after the report would have been submitted by the chief medical officer, of course we would have been confronted with the constitutional challenge put forward by Mr. Sankofa. In that process, a first bill, as the speaker for number three would have indicated when he was to make his contribution, would have existed already in draft form. That was more extensive, yes. And what I recall saying in July of 2019 is that because of the landmark court case with Mr. Sankofa, where the applicant was successful in getting leave of the court to be allowed to use marijuana for sacramental use, in his religion as a Rastafarian, we then had to shift gears and deal with the amendment to the same drugs uh, prevention and abatement of the misuse and abuse of drugs amendment bill, where the act then was amended by that bill. So that is what helped to basically stop the process of the fulsome discourse through this house of the previous version of the bill. And the Honorable um, Deputy Speaker is correct too in her statement earlier that because we then had a situation of the juxtaposition of the court case, we had to find a way to urgently, based on the ruling by Ventos, to deal with the matter of ensuring that the constitutional rights of the applicant would have been dealt with. And as a result of that, what that um, amendment dealt with apart from the fact that it spoke about having 15 grams and reducing the use to ticketable offenses, if I'm correct, the Honorable AG, you tell me if I'm wrong. At the same time, it also spoke to the use of marijuana in public, not using marijuana around um, children, not using it around schools. There was a delineated boundary set out in that amendment as well that spoke to that. And all of that was put in place. We also furthered the discussion later on by going to the point of expressing that we were taking on board the 11 non-controversial recommendations of the Marijuana Commission, yes. including but not limited to medicinal use and the development of research and development in the area of marijuana, yes. of the marijuana industry. And that would have been the crux on which the industry was going to be developed. Because let us not get it wrong, Mr. Speaker, neither speaker from this side of the house, neither the mover, the seconder, the deputy speaker before me, or myself, would have told anybody in public or in this house that the Team Unity government was planning to free up any weed. 
Marijuana is still very much for the most part a controlled substance and has to continue to be treated as a controlled substance, bearing in mind we all have international obligations which we are still responsible for upholding. At the same time, I would have indicated last year, July, that while we are in the middle of all of that, and we still are, for that matter, we were also, and we still are, in the middle of consultations with the WHO, the World Health Organization, as it relates to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which we have already given tacit approval to, but we are now sorting out that through the advice of our own legal department here. And of course, at the same time, while we are doing that, and here is where prudence by a team unity government comes in, we recognize that we are trying to achieve all of these things within an environment where you have challenges by non-communicable diseases, where 83% of your debts are due to NCDs, and one of the NCDs is cancer, and it's well established that certain cancers are, are caused by marijuana use. There are some studies that even link um, cancers, especially lung cancer, to marijuana use, for that matter, in addition to traditional tobacco use. So these are other considerations that are still very much on the table for us. So what we have in front of us now, Mr. Speaker, as outlined by the Honorable Mover, as clearly outlined in the objects of the bill before us, is that what we are trying to do here is an incremental development of a marijuana industry, starting first and foremost from the standpoint of an industry being developed along the lines of medicinal and scientific purposes. Today's debate has nothing to do with whether or not a Rastafarian or any other person of a different religious persuasion wants to go out and plant a whole field of marijuana. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. Okay? Let us stick to what we said the bill was intended for. We also, in our remarks, made it very clear that because it is incremental, we will be guided accordingly because it's an industry where, all, although you may have had almost maybe 100 studies done on it, some of them, as the previous speaker indicated, 60 or more of them by peer reviews, there's still a lot to be done, very much to be done because it is, for the most part, an infantile industry the world over. And even Jamaica, who may pride itself in being ganja land, still does not have a monopoly on all things scientific and proven when it comes to marijuana. We are just now starting out. So I would much rather the approach of our team unity government in making incremental steps when we say we want to develop a marijuana industry. Because it is still very much an infantile industry the world over. We also have financial and international considerations that we have to take on board. The honorable mover of the bill, the also the seconder, the AG, would have indicated that a number of countries and their banking sectors refuse to do business with people who are engaged in marijuana as a trade because they want to know the source of funds. Yes. And from where they are sitting, they don't want any money that the international community has considered to have been gained by questionable means or by drugs or products or manufacturing processes that have regulatory constraints on top of them. So if that is the case, how dare we in Little St. Kitts and Nevis feel we could go out and do any differently? Okay, because at the same time, we plan to continue to be a respected, though small, member of the international community, yes. and we will govern ourselves as such. Yes. Previous administrations may have chosen to do differently, but we do not have the luxury of laxity when it comes to that not for the kind of St. Kitts and Nevis we want to have, and the legacy that we are trying to build for young people to follow. I also want to make another point here, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it has to do with the fact that apart from what has been laid out by the mover of the bill and the seconder, is that yes, we are considering here today matters to establish the Cannabis Authority, which is spoken to in the, in the draft, the licensing modalities, considerations for a regulatory regime, etc. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that regulatory regime. No single piece of legislation in this honorable house could ever capture at any given time every conceivable issue that will pop up relative to a practice 
or a prohibition that this house is obligated to deal with. And that's where regulations come in. The regulations will be developed over time. We have pieces of legislation on our books here where the regulations are much bigger than the original parent um, legislation. But that is because as things evolve, you have to move with the times. And that will come. And, we, and for the record, the Attorney General's Chambers has a considerable body of work when it comes to the draft regulations. They have been in existence ages since when last year, April. But as over time when things change and the modalities of the development of the industry internationally change, you will have to work with that and make the changes accordingly and they too shall come. It's about incremental steps in an industry that we want to be very careful that we are setting up in an appropriate manner. So this government and this house and the people of this country should never feel intimidated that there should be a rush to judgment to do everything all one time. Yeah. There's no textbook out there that tells you this is how we, a dummy's guide to set up a marijuana industry. There's no university professor who has put out some sort of seminal work that says this is how you go about setting it up in five steps. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. So I would much rather the course that we are taking in making measured steps that make sense. And you build on that. And you build on the other legislative infrastructure that you already have. Because that is something we haven't said here yet. But there are other considerations that have to come into play. Our Public Health Act is one. Our mental health draft legislation is one. Because as I indicated in this house just this past December, the mental health, the treatment center would have served an average of 49 or so persons in 2019. And the majority of conditions that were treated were surrounding issues of schizophrenia, including but not limited to marijuana-induced schizophrenia. And the honorable um, seconder to the bill would have indicated the point, very valid point, about not using marijuana around children or serving it to them because of the science telling us that the human brain continues to develop up to age 24. That shouldn't be surprising. Equally, an, opt an optometrist will tell you that the human eye continues to go up to age 35. So if we know these basic, fa basic facts, then why would you want to arrest the development of a young child by introducing a substance that, for the most part, could have a deleterious effect on your health later on. So these are some of the considerations that I think we need to look at. The other point I would want to make here, Mr. Speaker, is that by going down the road of the development of the industry along medicinal and research lines, we are making sure that the people of this country are the people who will benefit from a marijuana industry. Quite unlike the Alki David scenario from last year. We don't want that. Okay? What we do not want, as him and others like him of similar ilk, who might be there waiting with bated breath at the door, thinking that they could waltz into the Federation and return us to a state of neo colonialism where they come in and our people become their workers, their vassals, or their serfs. This industry will have to be about the people of this country, run by the people of this country. Not the other way around. Okay, we have had a long history of slavery, and that is in the past. And we don't want to return to a neo-colonialist form of that in the establishment of this industry. The Cannabis Authority, if I could speak briefly to that. Sections 8 to 33 of the bill addresses that, its composition, rules of engagement, etc., and the responsibility for the hiring of staff, etc., how somebody demits office as a member of the board, which is set up as, part, as the governing authority, a body of the authority, etc. And the, mover for, the speaker for number three went to great pains to select out of the draft bill the fact that the minister of certain ministries, including but not limited to agriculture, health, and so forth, would have the right to be there ex officio or by a representative. Well, let us ask ourselves, what does ex officio mean? Ex officio means that you're there, but you have no voting rights, you know? Last time I checked, that's what that meant, isn't it? So, move minister, uh, member for number eight. Okay? So it doesn't mean that you're setting up a regime whereby it is being controlled by the ministers, but by virtue of the fact that those ministers have a stakeholder function 
as it relates to the development of the industry. It is imperative that you have representation of views from those ministries. Because if you're setting up marijuana as an industry, trade must be involved. If you're using land to grow marijuana, agriculture must be involved. I didn't tell you that either. However, if I can move on, I just wanted to make that abundantly clear. Access to marijuana for, med for medicinal use, parts 34 to 48, deals with that. The mover and the second of the bill went into quite a bit of that. And then, of course, I wanted to get to a point under those sections, and the Honorable Attorney General touched on it, and it has to do with doctors in the way they are allowed to prescribe medicinal marijuana to patients. You just can't have graduated with a medical degree yesterday or had it for 30 years, and you just decide tomorrow morning you're going to get up and prescribe medicinal marijuana. The regulations that we are trying to put forward and the legislation is telling us that you would have to ensure that you have gone to the trouble to take extra time to go ahead and be, tra be training yourself in understanding the, at least the basics of medicinal marijuana. You have to prove that you have experience in that area before you can proceed. Section 34B speaks to that quite clearly. Of course, the regulatory <coughs> regime that would accompany that would have an inbuilt mechanism to ensure that you must provide proof of training and proof of experience. So this tells me that the medical board now has a hand in the process. Because if you would wish to become a medical doctor who is authorized to prescribe medicinal marijuana, the same way you present your credentials to the medical board, you have to now do likewise to prove that you have the training and experience to do so. And that is required. And exactly. We go on further, we speak about the same doctor having to provide a medical certificate. In other words, he or she must make the case that the patient needs this thing and there must be an ID, and yes, there must be a register. The member from the other side also made the point about invasion of privacy, that all of a sudden people are gonna get to know your business in terms of who is on medicinal marijuana. Well, what do you think happens when somebody's being prescribed a controlled substance in this yes. country? There's a record but kept of it, because it's a controlled substance. Have we ever said otherwise? <laughs> Have we ever said otherwise? That is, the, that is a fact. And then part and parcel of all of this argument, why it is necessary to have a register. If you're treating somebody for autism or for epileptic seizures using the treatment, and the person has been on it for five years, ten years, for God knows how long, and nothing has changed, their condition hasn't improved, at some point, you might have to get to the, 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 the conclusion that the medicinal marijuana might not be properly indicated for that. At the same time, you might also want to keep track of it because you don't want it to become habit forming, depending on what it is. Or it's a case where even these people are part of ongoing research too. Because if they use it, and let's say six months, two years from now, their condition reverses, you would want to know and do further testing on the efficacy of medicinal marijuana to say, hey, I think we're onto something here. So that is why people keep a register, and that is why you keep track of patients. Exactly. My good friend is Every ministry will know. When you carry your prescription to the drugstore, what do you do? I must inform, inform this Honorable House again that there are other bits of legislation that will come into play to make the cannabis bill operational. One of them has to be a piece of legislation we passed here, I think it was last year, AG, the data protection legislation. That is part of your data, and if I recall correctly, in the definition section of that act, it speaks to data being inclusive of medical data. Yes. So the operation, uh, uh, the, for you yeah. to get this cannabis bill operational, it cannot happen in a vacuum. It yeah. must happen with a I'm family right. of laws working yeah. together. Yeah. Just yeah. like how you're going to have a family of ministerial yeah. interests working together to make it happen. Yeah. So that needs to be stressed. Of course, it makes some sense to focus on the, the, def the definition that is outlined in the bill as what you consider to be a qualified medical condition. 
The bill lists a number of them. I think it goes on to maybe about 10 or 11 possible areas. I might be wrong. But then it's not an exhaustive list, again, because the studies behind medicinal marijuana, they're still evolving. Yes. They're still taking shape. Some studies, some human trials for certain drugs might go on for 10, 15, 20 years. Right. Why should it be any different to have any, a different expectation for marijuana as a, as a drug to treat something that improves the life of an individual? I want to also draw particular attention as a, an operator within the Ministry of Health of the issue of the caregiver in the legislation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not to be taken lightly. Yeah. The caregiver in the legislation is clearly defined and it is there for a purpose. Because it says to us that there might be persons authorized to act on behalf of other individuals who cannot make decisions for themselves but for whom medicinal marijuana may be of value. These include children for a prescribed condition. It might include the elderly people who are mentally or physically challenged. But nevertheless, these persons must pass the litmus test to be considered a caregiver. And it is for that reason why, again, other pieces of legislation come into play to make the cannabis bill operational. For example, you must be sure that you will not have had conviction of offenses under several of our laws, including but not limited to the Proceeds of Crime Act, the Anti-Terrorism Act, Organized Crime Act, and the Drug Prevention and Abatement of the Misuse and Abuse of Drugs Act. And that is obvious, because you would not want to have anybody found guilty and convicted of any, any, any type of crime under these or other related acts who you're now going to trust to go out and purchase medicinal marijuana with a license to treat somebody else, because they have already proven by virtue of their conviction that you can't trust them. So it is important to have had that right inside there. Because from where we sit as a team unity government, children, the elderly, and physically and mentally challenged individuals are a special group of people that may not be in a position to defend themselves. And they need to be protected. Thank you so much, AG. If I may go on briefly in terms of the licensing of the supply of marijuana, part four of the bill is dedicated to that and section 49A through K would have gone into some detail to tell you the types of licenses we're talking about. Here again, we come into the regulatory framework. There is not room enough in this bill to tell you all the forms of license. That will come out in the regulations that are being drafted at this moment, some of which have already been prepared. So we need to remind ourselves of that. However, having said that, I would also hasten to indicate that section 50, subsection 3 of the bill is in there for a reason, because it also speaks to our adherence and our commitment to international best practices as it relates to the development of the sector, including but not limited to the issue of licensing. And for purposes of transparency, a number of these international standards are listed by, by virtue of the best practices that are obtained for example, to the good manufacturing process, um, practice, Europe good agricultural practice, the U US Department of Agriculture, and the US Food and Drug Administration, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. To show you the type of level that we would like to take this marijuana industry to. That we are not taking it lightly, we are doing it based on best practices, so nobody can take advantage of us or cast aspersions at us by saying we entered this thing without our eyes wide open. Exactly, because we expect to continue to be a positive, productive, and law-abiding member of the international community. And by that token, we would have to catch a step up to the bar of those international benchmarks. In terms of the regulatory regime, again, and I say this almost to the point ad, ad nauseum, that the regulatory mechanism is going to tell us how we operationalize this bill when it becomes law. And that means that as we build it out through the consultative process, to examination of best practices, etc., we will refine it over time. The mover of the bill said quite clearly, it is a work in progress. And nobody has all of the answers on it. Not us, not major countries, and not governments whose time had come and gone who want to get back in again. Yeah, yeah. Okay? That is how I look at it. Okay? 
In closing, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to make it abundantly clear, and this is with my hat on now as the Minister of State with Responsibility for Health, that when it comes to the research and development portion of this act which is being provided for by the legislation, we want to reinforce the point that our people, although we are willing and able to participate in research and development, will never be subjected to any invasive procedures as research is taking place when it comes to the marijuana industry. It is something that we have prided ourselves on and we would like to keep it that way. Because while we would want the people of St. Kitts and Nevis to benefit positively from a marijuana industry, either in terms of job creation, in terms of foreign exchange earnings, in terms of trademarks, patents, copyrights that could come out of groundbreaking <coughs> research, it cannot be at the expense of our people who will be used as lab rats or guinea pigs to get us there. Yeah. It will not happen. And by the same token, we would not subject citizens of other countries to be coming here to be guinea pigs nor lab rats either, because that is something that we do not believe in. I would also wish to, uh, to point out one other thing. That is to say that the Ministry of Health already has in place an ethical review board that has been put in place now, Minister Hamilton, for God, about at least three years. And we have reputable persons on it, including Dr. Jean Redmond and others. And we will be leveraging that type of ethical review structure in terms of the review of any proposals when it comes to research and development as it relates to the marijuana industry. With those words, Mr. Speaker, I wish this bill safe passage.